Someone who is involved in ordinary society and friendship and family relationships is going to forget it. It's not going to happen. Uh, you may be able to dabble in it a little bit, but you're not going to really go deep enough to reach success. For these people who are, you know, 99% of everybody in the world today, the chanting process is easy and sublime and very effective. So this chanting process is, of course, our main teaching. Our whole teaching is summed up in the words, Hari Bo. <laughs> Haribo. That's our whole philosophy. Chant the holy name of God. And you find that in every process, this holy name is very, very prominent. In every religion, the holy name is there. For example, the, the Christians say, oh, we worship Jesus Christ. And that's very nice. Because in Sanskrit, the same name, Jesus, is Isha. And the name Christ is Krishna. You see? Like Krishna in Sanskrit, when you go to Farsi language in the Middle East, becomes Krishna. And then when you come to Palestine and the Mediterranean region, there um, it becomes uh, Krista. And then you go into Greek, it becomes Christos. In Latin, Christus. In Spanish, Christo. In English, Christ. You see, it's the same word. Etymologically speaking, it's it related to the same exact roots. And there's no doubt that um, the same exact meaning is there in the ancient teachings. Similarly, the name Jesus in uh, Sanskrit is Isha. Isha becomes, in, in the, the Middle East, becomes Asia. In fact, the, the continent of Asia is named after Isha. Huh? Because in, in Sanskrit, to for, in certain declensions to form a possessive, you lengthen the first vowel. So Isha lengthened, it becomes Asia. You see, Asia, the continent, is named after Isha. Who, Isha means the first, the first devotee of God, the first son of God, born from, what does it say? Born before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with God the Father, by whom all things were made. And yet without him, nothing was made. Well, that perfectly describes Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma, who is also known in the Vedas as Isha. Huh? So Isha becomes Asha, and then in Palestinian language becomes Asos, in Greek, Iesos. In Latin, Iesus. Jesus. Jesus. You see? It's the same word. The same word. If you just follow back the, the etymology of the word to its original language, and then you know exactly what we're talking about, the same understanding is there in the ancient Vedas. But all this was covered up and made a secret in the West because of the materialistic desires of the Roman church and like that. But the knowledge is still there in the words. If you look deeply enough into the derivation of the words, the language will tell you everything you need to know. So, I've been talking for a long time now. What time is it? Okay. So now it's time for questions. I hope everybody went and listened to the assignment and... Uh, wrote down some good questions. <laughs> it's one of those questions, I was born on a dark and stormy night. Okay. Desire is lust that burns one up if wrongly directed. What comes, what comes to my mind in this is that my desire should be for Krishna since this is the only desire which, when fulfilled, quenches one's lust since the Lord is an eternal soothing water. 
So am I right to think my desire for Krishna consciousness is more important to fulfill than trying to get it together to get to Chile? I ask this since I am finding my efforts to attain finances is becoming a disturbance with respect to spiritual practice. Who is speaking so poetically? <laughs> Don. Who? Don. Don. Yeah. Well, we haven't talked about your coming to Chile. Um, generally speaking, we want people to complete the Bhakta course uh, before coming to Chile. We want to get to know you. Uh, you know, this is our Sangha here is a very private thing. It's, it's like um, we're going to be out in the middle of the woods working on the land, and, and we want to make sure that the people who are coming are qualified. Uh, this is the first time I think you brought it up. Isn't it? Well, anyway. So, what we would encourage you to do is to practice devotional service where you are. Become strong. Huh? Like, don't come because you're trying to get away from your problems. That's the wrong motivation. You'll bring your problems along with you. And you'll be just as miserable here as you are where you are now. You have to solve your problems where you are. Uh, where you are now is just as good a place as being here. The point is to apply the philosophy and experience the result. We want to see that you're making spiritual progress. Uh, that's the aim here. It doesn't matter whether you're here or you're there. The point is that you're making advancement and you're getting the results of the practices. Uh, so yeah, I would say, don't think about coming to Chile. Think about learning this esoteric teaching and applying it in your life and getting the result. Uh, that should be the primary goal. And then if it turns out to be, you know, a good thing to come to Chile, we'll all, we'll all figure that out at some point. It'll, all be, it'll become obvious to everybody, hey, this guy should be in Chile, you know? You can start a community right where you are. You don't have to go anywhere. If, if you really feel that, you know, this is the path for you, you can start a little local group. Use our videos to preach to people. You know, have a little meeting. Gather your neighbors and friends. Show a video. Discuss it. And then have a little prasadam. It's easy. We've been trying to get people to do this now for years. I don't know why nobody does it. Uh -huh. But uh, you have to experience the result first. It has to be real to you. Not that some magic is going to happen simply by being in Chile. You know, Chile is like every place else, except maybe a little farther away. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, we're here for a reason. We're here to protect the lineage. We want to make sure that our lineage survives. And that's our mission here. It's a little bit different. It's not exactly for our personal benefit, although, of course, we do get a lot of benefit from uh, pursuing that mission. But your mission or your priority should be uh, helping yourself, getting yourself situated on this path nicely. Uh -huh. So that, that's the first goal. That's what you should be thinking about at your stage. How do I learn this process and how do I apply it so that I get the result and I feel better? Okay? Okay. Uh, question from Devesh. How does one get to know whether he or she has moved from the first stage to the second stage or second to third? We discussed that the other day. Uddhava and I went back and forth with a couple of posts about that. Um, if the first stage is the offensive stage of chanting, then the second stage is the offenseless stage of chanting. Huh? There are ten offenses against the holy name. I'm not going to go into them now because we, we've discussed this so many times on, on the forum. 
when one's chanting is free from all those ten offenses, that's called offenseless chanting. Uh, and the technical term for that is nam abhas. Abhas means a reflection. Okay? So offensive chanting is, uh, it does not give any tangible result. You only get the result of chanting when the chanting is offenseless. See? So at least it has to be pure from those ten offenses. Now maybe you're not in pure love of God yet. But now you're, at least you're chanting offenselessly and you can work on developing pure love without going astray. The chanting process is it's compared in the scriptures to uh, a plant. Uh, when you plant the, 